you can sign, Ms. Soros, dear colleagues and friends, ladies and gentlemen, bonjour, buongiorno, buenos dias, guten tag, dobre dia. That's my language for today. <laughs> it's a pleasure being here today and an honor to have been invited to make a presentation on the issue of language rights in international law. So for this opportunity and privilege, really, I'd like to thank the Trust. Trace Foundation and its organizers. Before beginning, I have to clarify one thing. I'm not an expert on China, I'm not a linguist, I'm not an expert on the Tibetan people or its languages and culture. Um, you have other colleagues who today are much more knowledgeable in this area. <coughs> My background is international law and human rights, so I hope I'll be able to make maybe some small contribution to today's discussions from a very different perspective to what you've heard uh, this morning. <clears throat> so for the next 40 minutes or so, I would like to outline in a general way what kind of language rights could be said to exist in international human rights law. And there's one thing I need to emphasize. There's no use pretending that there are a large number of rights that you have in international law, because in the cold world of politics, there is the reality of the weakness of the international human rights uh, mechanisms that have to be explained. And in reality, what is available, available legally is often less than what many people think. Secondly, what I would like to do to this afternoon is to try to describe briefly how and why the language policies that apply in relation to minorities in general, but perhaps also to Tibetans in China may or may not conform to these international legal standards. And finally, I would like to make a few comments and observations and conclude perhaps as to what ought to be in place and explain why. But before I do that, because we are in New York, I just arrived uh, from Australia yesterday, uh, I'd like to give you a bit of an example of something that is perhaps uh, not well known. This is one of your neighbors or someone who doesn't live too far away from here, Woody Allen. And uh, in 1975, Woody Allen produced a movie called Bananas. And in that movie, one of his characters is in the middle of a revolution in the fictional country of San Marcos. The rebel leader eventually becomes a new presidente, and, but he is blinded by power. And among the very unpopular uh, decisions that he makes is that he adopts a policy that makes Swahili the official of language of this Latin American country of San Marcos. Now, what's the connection <coughs> between that movie, Bananas, and language rights in international law? <coughs> well, because in San Marcos, so very few people actually spoke Swahili. People resented the decision of El Presidente. By the way, that led to El Presidente being deposed and Mr. Uh, the character of uh, Woody Allen becoming the new dictator. But the decision of, of using this or making Swahili an official language was one of the decisions that actually led people to feel excluded, discriminated, a disadvantage. It was a completely inappropriate language policy, of course, for the country of San Marcos. So this is an example which, in a way, perhaps surprisingly, happens in the real world, where you have official language policies which are inappropriate in the context of a particular country, and perhaps, as I will be showing later, even in breach of what could be described as language rights in international law. So we'll come back to this story in a few moments. So with this story in mind, let me tell you about human rights. I'll start by pointing out that we have come a long way in the last, well, 20 years or so. Or so. We've come a long way in the acceptance that language diversity is something to be embraced and indeed protected rather than feared and dealt with as a kind of obstacle. 
since 2000, the year 2000, it's not that long ago, we have celebrated the 21st of February as International Mother Language Day. And this is a day where the international community uh, has accepted that we should promote linguistic and cultural diversity and multilingualism. But there's also another story behind the 21st of February that not many people know about. And I think it would be worthwhile to tell the rest of the story for a few minutes. The 21st of February exists as the International Mother Language Day because of a situation that occurred in Woody Allen's movie. What do I mean? Well, in 1951, 52, the government of Pakistan declared that Urdu, and only Urdu, would become the national, or should become, the national and official language of Pakistan. <laughs> and at the time, I should have had a map here, Pakistan was div divided between, between east and west. East would become what we know today as Bangladesh. But in 1951-1952, the government, national government of that period, announced that really we should have one official language, one exclusive language, the Urdu language. That was a problem, or at least one very serious problem. Almost half of the population of Pakistan, more than half of the population of Pakistan, did not speak Urdu. They were not fluent in Urdu. And in East Pakistan, you had about 98%, 98% of the population that were actually fluent in Bengali, approximately. So in East Pakistan, where you had almost half the population, these people were not fluent in the language that might become the only exclusive language of government, Urdu. For them, for a very large proportion, in fact almost half the population of the whole country, for them, this official language policy would exclude them, probably exclude them, from many categories of government jobs, employment, university positions, the police, the army, education at higher levels. It was this attempt to make Urdu the exclusive official language for East and West Pakistan that produced the first riots in the capital, or what would become the capital of Bangladesh, Dhaka. And on the 21st of February, 1952, the army shot at and killed 12 <coughs> students who were protesting against the language policies. This is the event that galvanized the spirit and resistance of the Bengali people and led to what is a monument, the Shahid Minar, the Martyrs Monument, but also known as the Language Monument, where these students were killed. This was the beginning of the independence movement, in fact, for, for East Pakistan, that eventually led to the creation of what we know today as the independent country of Bangladesh. That's the story of the 21st of February. We have a situation, or a date, where we commemorate the creation of a new independent state, the Bangladesh, the country of the people who speak Bengali. And it is not an accident. The 21st of February, International Mother Language Day, 